Hello, everybody. I'm John Plugak. I'm going to talk a bit about synergy between research and engineering. I've got uh, some examples from my past and some examples from Ben. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, attacking the team at Affinity, and then I'm going to give you some examples of lessons I've learned, hard lessons I've learned over time. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about specific tech and how it was developed and why these, how these lessons apply to that process. So first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I graduated here from Berkeley. Uh, I went to the University of Illinois after spending three years working at various startups. Uh, while I was at Berkeley, I actually worked on uh, software for nuclear power plants at a startup. And in between, I worked on video editing systems. Uh, and then I went to uh, the University of Illinois and worked on actors' languages for distributed memory systems, which both of those, uh, both those things became important and are actually important at Defendi because Defendi built distributed computers, computing systems uh, that run on actors based languages. So then I went to work at Inkme, which was an early startup, Eric Brewer's startup. Uh, and there I worked on network proxies. We actually built a proxy for AOL. And so, you know, anytime you had to reload over and over again, it was probably my fault. Um, after that, I worked at Cray for a while and worked on burning managers there. Then I moved to Google, where I managed a, a, a quant group. So this is a group of statisticians and engineers that did optimization. And there I learned how to work collaboratively with researchers and engineers to try to solve problems. I also worked at integrating uh, WebAssembly in the Envoy Network Proxy there, and that became important when I finally got to Affinity, uh, where I'm now a director, and I manage the groups that do networking, consensus, the node and also the boundary nodes, which are our network proxy. Affinity is home to the Motoko language, and we run everything there on the Actors programming language, which again ties all the way back in my PhD. So the tech we have at Affinity, just to give you some background to show you why some of these uh, examples I'm going to go on to are illustrative, um, is it, it's basically a blockchain, but the idea of a blockchain is you have to fail with Byzantine consensus. That means a consensus when some of the members may not be acting honestly. And the key technology that we developed is chain key, key cryptography. It's a way to ratchet forward these, uh, the, the group of nodes that's going to do the consensus and a way to do it very rapidly. And on top of that, we have a programming model that runs WebAssembly, which is the same sort of technology that's used to do high-performance programming inside your browser. And using that, we build smart contracts that allow you to have the sort of decentralized organizations that are run entirely in software. Uh, and the consensus then is done on state changes. So this is essentially RAID for computation. All of our nodes do the same computation. They then do uh, a Byzantine consensus to agree on the state transformations, and that's how their computation ratchets forward, and that builds the blockchain. Um, and this whole system is then protected on the outside by these founder nodes that do end-to-end -end security and routing, and all of that uh, forms the entire internet computer. So the team we have is mostly a combination of um, researchers uh, and engineers. The researchers are you know, PhDs in cryptography. We've also got experts in engineering and security as well as programming languages. And the engineers come from a variety of places including Google and are experts in files of execution, sandboxing, networking. They're systems engineers, they're SDK builders, they're compiler writers, um, consensus in cryptography. And all the teams are mixed, so uh, the researchers are embedded into each team, and they and the engineers collectively make all decisions and form uh, uh, each of these groups, like the networking group and the cryptography group. And together, we help to build synergy in each group, between these two group, subgroups, uh, to get the best out of both. 
So, some of the lessons that I've learned over time. First, it's very important to start with the problem. You might think that that, you know, would, would make sense. But, you know, basic researchers uh, like to start with solutions. They're very interested in tech, and they're very interested in applying that tech uh, just to problems themselves in the abstract, and not actually the problem, which is your product. So, you know, the key takeaway is that the product should drive the project. You should need to avoid unmotivated research um, as part of building a product. I mean, you can obviously have unmotivated research as basic research, but as building, in terms of building a product, it should be motivated, and we have to avoid premature optimization, applying fancy research you know, solutions in places that are inappropriate. Um, we can't over-engineer things. That's the other side. The engineers can make the same mistake. They cannot drive the engineering from the product itself, but through their desire to build big systems. So that's got to be over uh, avoided. And you know, in general, we just have to avoid overcomplicated solutions. So, you know, over my career, I've seen both the positive and the negative for these for this thing. So one example uh, is a project that I, I was involved in. There's this RDMA project that's uh, remote, um, basically the ability for one memory computer to read and write remotely memory in another. On another note, it's a very fast way of doing communication. So we had this project, and uh, it was actually a piece of technology looking for an application. The team that controlled it wanted to make sure that they continued to get funded, and they really didn't care that much how they, they got funded. They needed to attach themselves to a, pro a, a product so that they could justify their existence. And so they created this key value store, and they went around looking for customers. And as a result of this motivation, this non-product-driven motivation, they ended up basically destroying three other projects that had to get canceled because they couldn't meet their deadlines because they were overly complex and ill-motivated, right? So it's very important to start with the problem. On the other, on the other hand, we've got you know, Definity, uh, where we developed this change in cryptography, and it, was, it grew out of the problem. Something positive this problem, how can we do fast Byzantine consensus? How can we have a system that can be ended and secure, and that where we can verify the product of this blockchain uh, in a, in a, with a very simple algorithm that can be run in your browser, right? And the end result of that was involving a bunch of researchers and engineers to build a system that could solve that problem, and that's what we did. So, the next lesson is to mix it up. Basically, that means not having separate research and engineering groups. You have to have mixed groups. And the, reason that you have to do, the reasons you have to do this are multiple. First, um, it promotes mutual respect. And that's incredibly important, because if you don't have that, you can have researchers, for instance, throwing algorithms over to engineering that are very, very difficult to actually implement. And, and produce safely her product. Um, and conversely, you can have engineers who ignore uh, the, the requirements that the researchers want to achieve, right? And so then the product never achieves its goals. It also allows both sides to broaden their skills. Uh, it prevents groupthink because you've got two separate ways of thinking uh, involved in the project at the same time. Um, and it improves the diversity of ideas, it causes more out of box thinking. Because you, again, you've got this diversity, so a little less insular thinking process, and that in total increases your creativity. So, you know, I was involved in another project that didn't work out so well, and this was a, a video effects system that I worked on early on, and we spent 18 months building very, very elaborate designs and diagrams for a, a really innovative uh, uh, piece of hardware that was. You know, roughly equivalent to a modern day graphics uh, subsystem, but this was, you know, um, 30 years ago. Uh, and in the end, when everybody sat down to try to implement it, we threw it over the fence to the engineers. They spent three months trying to get it to work, only to realize that they just couldn't, that it was impossible to implement it based on the specification, and it was just a complete waste of time, right? And this was because those two processes and those two groups of people were separated. So conversely, at Affinity, we have a product right now, uh, the Threshold uh, ECDSA, which is a, a, a cryptographic 
signature system that's used for things like your TLS certificates um, and, and other you know, basic core pieces of the internet. And there we have mixed teams. So we have you know, some researchers and some engineers, and we have some people who cross over between the two sides. And together, right, they've been able to come up with a synergistic blend of their talents that's going to allow us to, to solve this problem in a much more effective way. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the third major lesson is uh, something I'm calling conceptual encapsulation. So basically the idea is that you've got to expose the critical details, uh, but still uh, black box most of the details. So a great example is like cryptographic primitives. I don't understand the math very well. It's not my forte. Uh, you know, I'm a compiler writer. I'm a big system builder. Uh, you know, but I am not you know at, at that level of competition. But if you give me a nice little black box and tell me how to apply it, I can use it to solve problems, and I can use it to engineer solutions. Another example is like what was said with sandboxing, right? Very complicated security problem. Lots of experts in that area, but on the whole, from the outside, it's a box. Once somebody says this thing's secure, it gives me some constraints. I can inject stuff into it, and, and security, you know, properly will be preserved. So, an ex example of, of where conceptual encapsulation breaks down is, you know, I, I worked on a network proxy where all the headers, you know, it, it's uh, the headers describe sort of metadata for, for your transactions. They were all treated as raw strings everywhere. The net result is that errors abounded. Every engineer who ever worked with any transformation on, them, on any piece of web data going through the system had to manually preserve all of the constraints, right? Just wasn't going to work. Conversely, like I was saying about this cryptography stuff at Trinity, we've convinced the, uh, the, the uh, cryptographic team create primitives and black box those things in such a way that the engineers can then take them and do something useful with them. A great example is we've got this thing called the random beacon. It's a, it's a way to construct an unpredictable random number you know, on a distributed computer. Uh, and once we have this, we can use this as a tool for other things. It's the basis for how we can do uh, consensus because it allows us to give an ordering Right for everybody, for, for all the participants in the consensus to say who can propose this block, right? And so that's how we can wrap forward the, the, the uh, consensus and blockchain. But it also gives us other things. So once we knew we had this random beacon, we can use it, for example, to create unpredictable random numbers. So that, for example, you could build, I don't know, a, a gambling site or a lottery site, right? Where you could mathematically prove that it was impossible for somebody to know what the next round number was going to be, even if they could look inside, even if they could, even if they owned one of the nodes and could break into the software there, they still couldn't predict what that next lottery number was going to be. So it's primitive, it's super useful, uh, and something that engineers could apply without actually knowing how the math worked. The last uh, lesson I have here is uh, listen and learn. So basically, research and engineering needs to have this mutual respect, and if they do, they need they, they they will then listen to the real concerns right of the other side. So the researchers have specific things that they think they need in the system, and the engineers have specific things that they think they need in the system, right? So you know, on the on the a negative example of this is I was working on this internet crawling system. It required some optimization, uh, and we designed on the research side an objective function, right? So this is just a way to say. What should be crawled next, right? The problem with it is that we didn't have mutual respect between the engineers and the researchers. And the engineers kept saying, well, this is never going to work for us. It doesn't work for this specific case. And the researchers just kept saying, but you can make the objective function do anything you want, right? And, but neither side was listening to the other. And the net result is that we spent months and months arguing back and forth. The concepts were not all that difficult. We simply just didn't have mutual respect. We couldn't make progress, right? Um, 
you know, conversely, at Infinity, when we were doing this, this threshold DDSA, ECDSA stuff, we did have this mutual respect. And so, you know, we would have a problem. It would be like, oh, wow, we need to generate, you know, a bunch of these quad uh, quadruples that we need to have in order to, to do the algorithm. And then the engineers would say, oh, but can we generate them ahead of time? And the researchers would say, well, yeah, well, yeah we can, okay? And so the engineers would say, great, I know how to do this. You just tell me, like, how many you're going to consume, how fast you're going to consume them, you know, how much it's going to cost me to generate these things, and I'll build a system that does that for you. And that way we can solve each other's problems without having to, uh, uh, you know, argue all day long. All right, how, how much time do I have left? Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to go over one example here. That's this chain key cryptography. So the idea is we want to take this research, uh, we want to take the, uh, research into a, turn it into a product, right? So we have these requirements. This fast, safe, Byzantine consensus. We want to tolerate malicious nodes. We want to be able to validate transactions quickly. We want to be able to move nodes in and out of the network. And we want to be able to maintain the network, right? So the key bit of technology were these threshold signatures. So a threshold signature is a way to break up the, a normal cryptographic signature such that you need n of them, right? You need, you know, if you have seven people, you need four of them to sign it, right? And, and then the four of them signed it, you can take those signatures and turn it into a single, single signature that then you could pass along uh, to, to prove that this thing has actually been signed. And the solution uh, that researchers came up with was to have these multiple dealers for randomness uh, to prove that they could encrypt the, the, the shares and to combine these shares into a single public key, right? So that's the solution that they came up with. And in order to allow us to evolve the network, which is an engineering constraint, right? Because you know, in theory, nothing ever fails, but in practice, nodes fail, and so you have to replace them. Uh, we worked with the, the research team and they came up with this idea of resharing the, the, these secret shares and then every node could, that could, every new node could then generate new secret shares that they could then use to do this threshold signature. And so that, that uh, interaction, that evolution of thought uh, allowed us to solve some of these very core problems and to innovate. So I'm going to just skip ahead here. Uh, uh, why don't we just, yeah, so the end result is that with synergy comes fast innovation. And so we quickly produced this product uh, on which now a ton of people can even build really interesting things. We've got fleet doing hosting, district is doing some professional network stuff. We've got decentralized message board. Um, we've got this Motoko playground, which is a free IDE that people can use to build. Uh, contracts on this blockchain, and we've got uh, free deployment of those dApps onto the internet computer, all of which were, were done because we were able to innovate very quickly and build a product that was, you know, safe and satisfied all these nice security and performance goals. Um, so if anybody has any questions? Yeah, so we have time for one question. Um, you talked about the chain faster than the consensus, and um, you know that there's a lot of hype, obviously, tons of apps being developed in fintech. I mean, where, where else do you see gaps in the technology uh, right now that we should all be aware of as we think about you know, uh, the ever exciting and growing space of blockchain? Yeah, so there's there's not, you know, the, the big problem is there are a lot of people out there's a lot of non-tech out there. There are a lot of people who are building things and they don't have any strong theoretical basis for it, right? One of the nice things about Infinity is that we do. We've got we basically raided the, uh, the Zurich IBM Research Lab and stole all their photographers. That that's you know, that's the underlying reality. Um, but there's a lot a lot of people who just don't have it. They 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 produce things that aren't really secure and are not going to solve, you know, the problems that they claim. They can't scale. What you know, uh, for example, I mean, you know, people think of Bitcoin as being decentralized, but in reality, 
there was a time when there were, I think there were four guys in China who, could, who owned the thing. They had, they had a 51% attack. So, you know, the, the hard part about it is, and this is what I was trying to get at through this, this you know, conceptual encapsulation thing is, yeah, if you're going to invest in this field or work in this field, you have to understand it well enough to satisfy your own questions and to solve and to answer them yourself, right? You, you need to have a way to wrap your head around these ideas without, you know, getting a PhD in mathematics, right? And so that's the challenge to anybody investing or working in this area. Great.